They are the Alphas in a world of Alphas. They resent the way the Soviet Union surrendered in the 1990s and they are committed to the idea of Russia as a global power. Known as the Siloviki, they are ruthless, cunning and tenacious. They are closely identified with Putin, forming his most trusted advisors and making up what is the machinery of the Russian state. But what sets the federal Siloviki apart from the broader Russian elite is that they possess extraordinary hard power. The FSB, for instance, has around 160,000 members. That hard power is not to enforce the law, but to enforce control and order, sometimes against the law itself. And while most nations have a social contract that emphasizes economic growth, stability or electoral representation, the Siloviki believe that in Russia legitimacy derives from military conquest. They believe that Russia is an exceptional nation, destined to be a premier global power. If repression is necessary to achieve that goal, then so be it. This is a group of men who will not take no for an answer. So, who exactly are the Siloviki? And if they have Putin's ear, what exactly are they saying? Today's video is sponsored by Masterworks. Global markets have seen better days. Crude oil is at $100 a barrel, natural gas is reaching $4 a gallon, and almost one-third of the world's supply of wheat is unavailable for harvest. Grocery bills are higher than before, and people are starting to scramble. In normal times, one could invest in alternatives like real estate or bonds. However, with a housing bubble approaching and bonds anticipating negative yields, those options are starting to look a lot less attractive, especially as inflation shows no signs of slowing down. That's why I am diversifying my portfolio with blue chip art. Masterworks is the platform I use. According to Deloitte, the total wealth held in art is projected to grow from the current $1.7 trillion to $2.6 trillion by 2026. That is impressive growth, and fine art has been going at that pace for decades. From 1995 to 2021, contemporary art prices outpaced the S&P 500 total return by 164%. By using Masterworks, retail investors like myself can invest in fine art and own a slice of Banksy, while also diversifying my portfolio with blue chip art. Use the link in the description to gain priority access, doing so really helps our channel, so go check it out. Just be careful in everything related to investing, there's no such thing as risk free. Oligarch is a term often used to describe the ultra-rich Russian class which accumulated exceptional wealth in the 1990s. Since then, the term has been synonymous with political influence. Though the club of entrepreneurs did dominate political affairs during the Yeltsin era, the hold of the oligarchy was broken beyond recovery by Putin in his first tenure in office. When the top dogs, Boris Berezhovsky, Vladimir Gushinsky and Mikhail Khodorkovsky were repressed and driven abroad, the rest of the oligarchy fell in line. Russian billionaires were allowed to keep their businesses provided that they vowed unconditional obedience to the head of the state. And that's how it has been for more than a decade. The oligarchy as a political power broker is gone though, admittedly, the concept itself has survived. In its place, however, emerged a new, smaller group of policymakers known as the Siloviki. Taken literally, Siloviki means the powerful. That is not much to go on, but what they lack in imagination, they more than make up in political influence. Since coming to power, the members of the Siloviki have enrolled into offices throughout all branches of governance in Russia, with a particular focus on military and security-related agencies. 
the members of the Siloviki operate military factories, employ tens of thousands of security agents, recruit and deploy spies, draft national policy, etc. Most of the Siloviki are former KGB members, some are former military officers and still some are civilian technocrats. The federal Siloviki has remained homogenous since its inception and its members make up Putin's inner circle, fueling his geopolitical anxieties. The Siloviki judge things by capacities, not rhetoric. Everyone outside Russia is a suspect, probably harboring plans for destruction. And as per Murphy's law, anything that can go wrong will go wrong. If NATO is technically capable of harming Russian security, then it will eventually do exactly that in due time. No amount of promises or guarantees will diminish the threat. To the members of the Siloviki, treaties and agreements are merely suggestions. Nothing is binding when it comes to security. This may seem like a strange way of looking at things in the 21st century, but it's a mindset shaped by centuries of Russian history and statesmanship. In the Siloviki's monolithic worldview, Russia is a fortress under siege, fighting for its place in the world that is denied by the West. And the only objective mechanism that can truly ensure security is geography. This is precisely why the members of the Siloviki subscribe to the beliefs of Alexander Dugin and the Heartland Theory. They believe that Russia must transform itself into a Eurasian superpower so that it can challenge the Western Hemisphere for global supremacy. And as far-fetched as some of these ideas seem, they are all transmitted to the executive office. So, in a way, the members of the Siloviki fuel Putin's anxieties. This then explains some of the decision-making by the Russian president. The list of the Siloviki members is extensive, with each coming from different backgrounds. Some of the names include Nikolai Patrushov, Secretary of the Security Council of Russia, Sergei Narushkin, Director of the Foreign Intelligence Service, Alexander Bortnikov, Director of the FSB, Sergei Ivanov, former KGB and now Special Representative to the President, Sergei Shaigu, Minister of Defense, Valery Gerasimov, Chief of the General Staff, Sergei Lavrov, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Dmitry Rogozin, Director General of Roscosmos, Igor Sechin, CEO of Rosneft, and the list goes on. These are the men who surround Putin on a daily base, forming his inner circle. And some of their beliefs are borderline conspirative. Patrushov, for instance, who is a career intelligence officer and longtime friend of Putin, believes that the United States wants to break apart Russia as a country and that Ukraine is the platform to that end. Patrushov is not necessarily wrong, but his policy views form a self-fulfilling prophecy. Then there is Narushkin, head of Russia's foreign intelligence service, who has known Putin since the 1990s. Narushkin is so influential that every so often he is brought up as a potential successor to Putin. In his daily activities, Narushkin heads the Russian Historical Society which is tasked with historical revisionism with the goal of whitewashing interpretations of Russian history. Narushkin also believes that the poisoning of government critic Alexei Navalny was an American plot to bolster the Russian opposition. He is also the person who started the whole Nazi Ukraine narrative. Meanwhile, Bortnikov, who is the head of the FSB intelligence service, plays a key role in ensuring security and control over Russia. His security apparatus employs hundreds of thousands of agents, and collectively they oversee counterintelligence, border security, electronic surveillance, but also suppressing political dissidents. Bortnikov is one of the key power brokers in Russia. Finally, there is Shaigu, head of the Ministry of Defense. Shaigu doesn't come from a military or intelligence background, he is a technocrat who climbed the ladder of power. 
As defense minister, he is responsible for modernizing the Russian military and he is often a key component in security decision making. Shaigu is credited with overseeing the takeover of Crimea in 2014 and the Russian intervention in Syria. He is also the one who ordered the military buildup near Ukraine, which was then used to invade the country. However, with the way things are going, Shaigu's health may be tied to what happens in Ukraine. Now, for context, we also need to mention Ramzam Kadyrov. As head of the Chechen Republic, Kadyrov is a power broker in Russia in the same sense of Bortnikov and the others. Kadyrov has a large personal military force that is practically separate from the Russian armed forces. However, Kadyrov is no friend to the federal Siloviki. In fact, Kadyrov has a heated rivalry with Bortnikov that goes back a decade. The two don't see eye to eye. Nevertheless, Kadyrov is worth mentioning because his personal shock troopers serve a valuable geopolitical role, earning him a place in the Kremlin. The list of the Siloviki members goes on, each coming from different backgrounds, but collectively the Siloviki members possess remarkable heart power and the will to use it. The FSB for instance has around 160,000 members and Kadyrov boasts of having at least 70,000 shock troopers. Those are substantial numbers however one looks at it. For the Siloviki, the national agenda must prioritize domestic security in addition to threats from the outside. The Siloviki believe that public order is the number one priority since that is how Russia imploded twice in the 20th century first as the Russian Empire and later as the Soviet Union. So for the Siloviki, public order and security must be maintained at all times if a third implosion is to be prevented. Hence the overcompensation on numerically large security forces across Russia. The Siloviki however are not omnipotent and neither is Putin. Though the Siloviki are loyal to Putin, they can flex when threatened. And there is a precedent. Back in 1991, when Mikhail Gorbachev's reforms set in motion the steady dissolution of the Soviet Union, the security apparatus at the time, the forerunners to the Siloviki, intervened and detained Gorbachev. And even though that coup failed and the Soviet Union collapsed anyway, it illustrates that men of power will intervene when their own interests are at stake, even against the seemingly untouchable head of state. Putin of course knows this better than anyone and at the backdrop of the Ukraine war, the resemblances are obvious. Should Putin's system start to rot? the Siloviki members are likely to do whatever it takes to protect their own interests. They have the numbers and the know-how to take down Putin. And while it's fair to assume that Putin has the means to monitor his subordinates, he cannot check on things constantly with great accuracy. There is just too much ongoing. As an insurance policy, however, Putin did something that his peers did not anticipate. On the eve of the Ukraine war, on February 21, Putin gathered his security council and listened one by one to see if anyone had objections to military operations against Ukraine. Of course, none spoke against it. The whole meeting was a theatrical display meant to tie the destiny of the Siloviki to Putin's well-being so that none could place the blame for the Ukraine war solely on the shoulders of Putin or overthrow him in a palace coup. This insurance policy was then televised nationwide. Every member of the Siloviki is on public record as supporting the war in Ukraine and none can now weasel out and claim that they put up a fight. For all intents and purposes, the Siloviki establishment as powerful as it is, fielding manpower in the thousands, employing spies abroad and keeping a lid on public order from St. Petersburg to Vladivostok is now on the same ship as Putin and there are no lifeboats available. I've been your host Shirvan from Caspian Report. If you found this video useful, please leave a like, comment and subscribe. 
and remember to click the bell icon so you don't miss out on our latest content. Thank you for watching and Sol.